Bob Goodman is a well-known economic consultant. He is a former consultant for a well-known firm known as Putnam Investments. While with Putnam, he was a member of the company's business advisory group, a panel of experts on economic, business, and personal financial topics. He also served the company as a senior economic advisor and managing director. During his career, Bob has served as a consultant and spokesperson before a broker, financial service industry, and business groups. He is consistently quoted in the media and appears frequently on the cable news network. He has also been a regular guest host on CNBC's Squawk Box. Bob is the author of the popular book, Independently Wealthy, How to Build Financial Security in the New Economic Era. You all know Bob because he's been a speaker at several of our BRI meetings in the past. He has served as a chief economist with J&W Seligman and Company between 1972 and 1989. He has also been an economist at Citibank and the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Please welcome Bob Goodman. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, thank you all for coming. First of all, I want to wish you all a very, very happy new year, healthy one. Uh, given that Jeff's already given you the surprise for the evening, I will tell you if I'm even half correct, this could be a very happy year for you indeed. Now, I don't have to tell this group that the last five years, the last ten years, has been unique in the financial industry in the real estate industry. Tough is an understatement. This has been unprecedented. But I want you all to know one very important fact. The fact that you are here right now means you have made it in the worst of times. <laughs> and despite, and I want to make this clear, despite the actions of our government, not because of them, you are about to experience a renaissance in this business that will last for many years. Now, I'm not saying this will start in February. I'm not stupid. Or March or April. But what I have learned in this business over 40 years of observing this thing, it is if you are there when it turns, whether it turns from bad to good, or believe it or not, from good to bad, you can make a lot of money for yourselves and your clients. It's not the short-term cycles that matter, especially for real estate, and especially for investors. I couldn't tell a trader anything. They take what the market gives them day to day. At five in the morning, they're watching CNBC. Most of the good ones are watching it with the sound off. <laughs> so what I'm going to say today is going to give you, I hope, a, a broad view, a macro view of the kind of environment you will be dealing with. And for the first time since I've talked to this group, it will be much more favorable to what you are ultimately trying to do. And for exactly the opposite reason that most people think. So let me try and put this in perspective. I've been given a couple of minutes to do all this. I promise you I will take more than two minutes. Sorry, Jeff, but I will. The economic environment is formed by economic policy. That's how it works. It is important for long-term trends to know and understand what the Federal Reserve Board is doing about the conduct of monetary policy. And believe me, it's a lot more simple than you might think by reading the Wall Street Journal. It's also critically important to this group that you understand fiscal issues, the spending and the taxation policies of the Congress and the administration, not just this one, but subsequent ones and previous ones. The problem that we face right now, and this is an analogy you can use with a client. Put it in terms people can understand. You don't need economic terms or symbols or mathematics. Think of somebody in a rowboat with two oars. One oar 
the monetary oar is in the water and you are rowing as fast as you can. But the other oar, the fiscal oar, is in the boat. Where do you think that boat is going to go? Around and around and around. And if you spring a leak, you're going to sink. You're not going to get it to shore. Well, that's the environment we've been in. Just talk to anyone who has had anything to do with the conduct of monetary policy, and they will tell you it is the most frustrating of environments for the Fed. In the absence of the type of fiscal policy we need at this stage in the cycle, indeed with the federal government going exactly in the wrong direction, the Fed has been giving us all the liquidity it can possibly give us. QE1, QE2, QE3. They've been pouring liquidity out into the system. The banks are flush with money. And they leave it with the Federal Reserve Board that pays them to leave it there. They're scared to death to lend the money for some very good reasons. Number one, they were blamed for the financial collapse in 2008. Many of you work for banks. And you know this, maybe you don't talk about it, but you know what happened back in the late 70s and the early 80s. We wanted people to have the American dream. And what was that? It was to own your own home. But the banks were selective. They didn't want bad loans on their books. They wanted people who they thought could pay back those mortgages, to pay back the loans. So someone got on the phone and said to him, you know, uh, you're not lending up here above 96th Street. You're not lending in, in California, in this area, that area. There must be something. Are you redlining? We may come in and just take a look at your books. Banks didn't want any part of that for obvious reasons. So they start to lend to people where good sense would say you don't do it. They were taking on worse and worse quality loans. And then some genius, probably a kid about 25 years old with an MBA, <laughs> said, oh, you don't want these loans on the books. Let's do this. Let's package them all up. We'll, we'll put them all in an investment. We'll get the credit agencies to give it a AAA rating because, you know, real estate never goes down. And we'll sell these mortgages to investors. And oh, by the way, we'll make very handsome fees. And when we get these loans off the books, we'll make more, package them up, and sell those. That became a very lucrative business until some of those loans went bad, predictably which is why the banks didn't want to make them in the first place. And the rest is, unfortunately, history, and you lived in it, in that sinkhole as things spiraled out of control. And the Federal Reserve Board wisely said, we've been here before, and we know what to do, and we're going to pour out all the liquidity that we need to shore up the financial system, and it worked. It worked. The banks have all these funds, but now they're reluctant to lend them very high requirements. I will say this to you and then I'll explain why. The best thing that can happen to you personally and to your business is that interest rates start to really go up. Now people say, well, interest rates go up. People won't buy homes. Really? Ask your client a very simple question. They've had their eye on this beautiful 75 inch plasma TV and they've been told wait it's going to go down in price and they wait and sure enough it goes down in price and they go oh, not yet wait it's going to go down further and they waited and it went down further but one day the price stopped going down it actually ticked up a little bit and they were told wait it'll come back down again you'll, you'll get your chance and it went up again. And the person says, well, no, just wait now, this is just temporary, it's gonna go back down again, you'll get your check. And it went up again. At some point, you're gonna, I'm not waiting anymore. Maybe I can't get that bottom price, but this is the lowest price in 50 years, I'm gonna buy that TV. That's what's going on in the real estate business. People were able to get mortgage rates at three and a half, four percent the lowest rates since the Depression. 
They were going to wait. Yeah, it's a nice house, but I don't want to pay 4%. My friend just got three and three quarters. I'm going to wait. And they waited and they waited. And I'm telling you, it is just around the corner. Those rates are going to begin to go up for good reasons, not bad reasons. People in my business, in the financial area, think when interest rates go up, the stock market goes down. Absolutely wrong. Why will interest rates be going up at some point in here? Because demand for loans will pick up. Not necessarily a lot of inflation right away, because loan demand will pick up. And interest rates go up like any price will when demand begins to exceed supply. And then they'll say, oh my goodness, 5% looks really good. I'm not going to wait and let it go to 6. That's what they're talking about on CNBC. I'm not going to wait. Then your phone starts to ring. And you guys say, well, I can't get you the four, the four and a half, but for you, we got a nice four and seven eighths mortgage for 30 years. But you can't wait, it's gonna go to five. I'm telling you, it's on the way up now. And people act on that. And then you're so busy, you can't handle it. And you don't remember what that's like. You gotta go back 15 or 20 years to remember what that was like. But you're on the verge of seeing it. You know what I would like in it to here? The way it was in the equity business back in 1981, early 82, the worst of all possible worlds. The stock market for 10 years had gone from 1,000 on the Dow to 777. I mean, that's a hell of a 10 year record. Inflation had been soaring. And then something happened. The government, because they didn't have a choice, not because they wanted to, changed the rules. They made it in a very hospitable environment for equity investors by lowering taxes across the board, unprecedented. Not because they wanted to, not because they like rich people or poor people. They had no choice. The economy was imploding. They cut capital gains, taxes, dividend taxes across the board. And with the Dow Jones at the time at 777 and people opening up those windows on Wall Street, the market turned up and it never looked back at the worst possible time from the point of view of the average investor. Because policies changed. Now, what I'm going to suggest to you may be tough to believe, and you're going to have to wait to see it. And I assure you, before you think I'm right, you're going to think I'm dead wrong. This government has been going in the wrong direction. Well, the Fed has been doing all it can, they're out of bullets. They'll never tell you that, for obvious reasons. Can you imagine the Fed coming out and saying, we're done? <laughs> Nothing else we can do, folks. <laughs> But they have a 1930s problem, and Ben Bernanke knew it. It's called a liquidity trap, where you cannot push interest rates low enough to get things going anymore. You can throw out liquidity, but nobody lends the money. And what's worse, people aren't spending money. The only answer to our problem now is to take that ore that's in the boat and put it in the water and start rowing. The government up to now has been doing just the opposite, talking about sequestering funds. Keynes, the British economist, would be spinning in his grave if he knew that. If you took Econ 101, this young lady Rachel over here took economics in school, she knows this. If I gave you a question on an exam, as a freshman economics student, and I said, you have an economy that is literally collapsing, demand is flat to down, what would you recommend the government do? Well, the first thing you would say, well, the Fed's got to pump out liquidity. Good, and they're doing that. But what about fiscal policy? What would be your recommendation? If you said I would cut spending, raise taxes on the very people, by the way, that are spending money, you get an F. That's what they're doing. And you know what's so interesting and why history is so important? We are making a comparable mistake that was made in the 1930s that led to the Depression. But then it was a monetary mistake, not a fiscal mistake. 
back then, with the economy sinking into recession, you know what the Federal Reserve Board did back then? They raised rates. They imposed a tariff on our trading partners to save American jobs, not realizing they will retaliate and they raise theirs, and the world fell into a depression. In 1932, and I'm telling you this to put this in perspective because this is a major turning point. A new administration that didn't know Keynes from a hole in a wall, what FDR said was, we don't want a revolution in the United States. I mean, a real French-style revolution. 25% of the people out of work, that is not good. They said, we've got to put him back to work, even if what we've got to do is pay a guy to dig a hole and pay his friend to fill it up. Because that person will get a paycheck and spend it and put somebody else to work. We don't care if initially it's not productive. We don't care. But what they did, they started the TVA, CCC, WPA. They put people to work. And you know what happened? And people don't know this. During what we consider to be the 1930s, the Great Depression, starting in 1932, the economy turned up. In the four years between 1932 and 1936, the American economy, because of policies we enacted, because we had no choice, grew on average 8.5% per year in real terms. We've never seen anything like that before. That unemployment rate dropped from 25% down to 14 on its way down. The equity market, people don't realize this, had fallen from 1929, 400 on the Dow Jones, by 1932 was 32. Heck of a hit. Between 1932 and 1936, responding to the health of the economy, it went from 32 back to 200. Had you seen it? Had you understood then what was going to happen because that's the way markets work? That would have been a hell of a return. But in 1936, and I want to caution you all, this is where it becomes very similar to today. With all of what was going on, our government got worried because the debt was going up. We were borrowing this money to do all this. The deficit was growing. And we focused our attention on the debt and the deficit. Familiar? And so we wanted to cut back on spending and raise taxes. And they did. The economy went right back into a depression. And the only thing that got us out of that depression, folks, was the demand created by World War II. Demand. It was a demand problem. Not a supply problem. A demand problem. If consumers won't spend and businesses won't spend and we can't sell our exports, then the only thing left is for the government to get into the system and spend it. Not a democratic idea, certainly not a republican idea. It's economics. It's just the way it works. After World War II, the feeling was we were going right back into depression. Until some genius realized, called Marshall, named the Marshall Plan, said, you know what? The world's productive facilities have been decimated. Europe has got to regrow itself. Japan's got to regrow. We can produce all this stuff here. Let's give them $12 billion, which was a huge amount of money. In the Marshall Plan, they have no choice but to buy all this stuff from us. And we started to grow. And the rest is history. So you can see today the mistake we've been making up to now has been a 1930s style misreading of what's necessary. Focusing on the debt and the deficit is a mistake. Now, do we want the debt to grow forever? Of course not. But I heard people worrying about it in 1982. We'll worry about it 25 years from now. We will not in our lifetimes pay it down. The likelihood is that in 10 years we owe not 17 trillion, we will owe 25 trillion. But it doesn't matter. Number one, you have to remember one thing. We've got the world where we want it because they have no place to invest their money but here. Nowhere. 
You think Russia buys American bonds because they love us or that China's put a trillion dollars in American securities because they like us? They got nowhere to go with it. We can print money and they have no choice but to take it and there is not going to be an alternative in our lifetime. So worrying about that is a false issue. What this government has done, they have stumbled into the solution. Stumbled into it. And now it's a political, not an economic problem. How do Republicans and Democrats all look good doing this, given what they've been saying for the last four or five years? Well, here's the deal. In this latest agreement, which is all but done, the president's going to sign it, they've cut back a little bit on that sequester. That's a done issue. They're not about to take funds out. The sequester is really over. They're taking steps in the short run to assure that we don't go into a recession for a very good reason. You go into a recession now with this mindset of keeping a lid on spending and raising taxes to make things all nice, you'll go into a depression. They don't want that for political reasons. They'll get thrown out of office. That's their motivation. So now it behooves both the Democrats and the Republicans to come up with a plan. Short term, the more you put into the system, the better it is. Unemployment insurance, I am all for it. You can argue all you want, it's not productive, this guy's laying on a couch, you give him a check, he's gonna buy a suit, he's gonna go to a movie, somebody's been going to be taking the tickets from that guy in the movie, you put people to work. That's 1930s style stuff because it's a 1930s problem, not a 1980s problem when it was a supply issue. Totally different approach. So if you hear that they reinstate unemployment insurance, be very, very optimistic about that because it's putting money in the system. In the short run, they will not raise taxes. They'll talk about it and the inequality and all. They're not going to do that which will most likely assure that this year, although sluggish, the economy is going to be growing. Is it going to be enough to get the unemployment rate down? Well, here's something very interesting. If you don't reinstate the unemployment insurance, this is what the Republicans think, if we don't reinstate it, these people drop out of the labor force. The unemployment rate will drop. That will make us look good. I mean, we might have a lot of people. I think we, we don't see those folks. Unemployment rate might go to 6%, but it's arithmetic. It doesn't mean economic health. So they don't want to do that. So in the short run, it's likely that we'll avoid a recession this year. But they've bought time to put a long-term strategy together that will make both parties look good doing it, Think about this. What do the Republicans want? They'll tell you all the time. We want lower tax rates, right? Lower tax rates, and we want spending to slow down. They call it a cut in spending. What everybody really means is a slowdown in the growth rate. Right now, if we do nothing, government spending is programmed over the next 10 years to say grow 4% a year. People say we want to cut it. What they really want to do is cut it to 2 or 3% a year. Still grows. On the tax side, what do the Democrats want to do? They want to raise taxes on the rich. If the rich people did this to us, we know that. I mean, come on. <laughs> These rich folks, man, they're really out for themselves. I told you this two years ago, three years ago, and four years ago. Inequality is a natural outcome from a market-oriented system. Our economic system is blind, folks. Doesn't care what you look like. Male, female, black, white, pink, green, yellow, doesn't care. What it does is it gives people purchasing power in proportion to their contribution to the system, no more, no less. You want to raise the minimum wage? Maybe for a year you might make somebody feel better. And then they got to pay the higher prices that the companies are going to require and they're right back where they started. You cannot, in the long run, pay somebody more than they're worth. You can't do it. Don't confuse an economic argument with a, with a social argument. Would anybody in this room say that A-Rod 
the baseball player, is worth 40 million bucks a year, and the best neurosurgeon in this country might make 10 million? Of course not. Can't compare the social value of these two folks, but economically speaking, A-Rod is worth more than the neurosurgeon. Also, don't make this mistake. Corporations are not in business to hire people or even to address the inequality. They're in there to make a profit. They're going to do whatever it takes, hopefully legally, to do that. If I'm a shareholder and I see that my company is doing something that raises its costs that they can't offset with higher prices, their margins get squeezed, and my dividend is threatened, they're gone. So don't look for corporations to do this. Inequality is something we're going to have to live with and accept culturally, period. But what they're going to do to make both parties look good is it's very likely you'll hear about lower tax rates. Dem Republicans want lower tax rates. Fine. Let's have four flat tax rates. 25, 20, 15, and 10. 25 percent. However, at the upper end, we're going to take away all your deductions, all of them. Even your mortgage deduction will be limited. That sounds bad, doesn't it? So when you think about it, if you tell me you're going to lower my marginal rate to 25%, which would in increase my take-home pay, but then take away my deductions, which will lower my take-home pay, and you leave me, I want you to hear the word, neutral, revenue neutral is what they're going to call it, I could care less what they do. My taxes haven't gone up, but I do know this, every additional dollar I earn, whether it's capital gains or dividends or income, I'll keep 75% of that dollar and not 65%. That gives me an incentive to do what I do and work harder. So the Republicans get the lower rates and the Democrats will get more revenue. Not immediately, because it's revenue neutral, but you wait. When it's finally scored over the next 10 years, because the economy will be seen to grow faster, those lower rates will be levied on more income. And guess what, folks? Revenues would grow faster over the next 10 years because of growth than they will under the present situation. And here's the kicker. During this period, they will get into entitlements. Believe me, they will somehow find a way to change the index on Social Security, maybe raise a little taxes there by getting people at the higher income levels to pay more, all in the context of neutrality. But debt, or government spending rather, will grow more slowly revenues more quickly and over a 10 or 15 year period, this is what you're going to hear on CNBC ultimately, those lines converge. They eliminate the structural deficit. That means debt grows because we'll borrow money every year. 800 billion, 600 billion, 500 billion, 300 billion, add it all up, maybe 25 trillion dollars of debt in 10 years. However, what matters to the rating agencies and to investors is not the level of debt. If a client came to you and said, look, I owe, I owe a million bucks, what would that tell you about their financial condition? Nothing. What's your income? Income is 50 grand a year, you got a problem. <laughs> if you're making three million a year, let us lend you more. It's the ratio. It's the burden of the debt. And if debt is growing like this and the economy is growing like that, the debt burden, which is now 100% of a year's GDP, will start going down. That directional change is enough for S&P, who right now is being sued by the government for $6 billion because of the ratings they were giving people back about six or seven years ago. The excuse they need to say, you know, we're going to put the United States on a credit watch for an upgrade. Taking them off the hook. And let me tell you, in the equity markets, at that stage, you already want to be fully invested. So what I'm suggesting to you is this. For the best 
we, in the last 10 years, this is the best chance we have. We can blow it, but the odds are because the politics now favors them doing these things from both sides. We have a chance to see this economy of ours, which is so resilient, which has taken every shot we have given it. You let this magnificent machine rust. We apply the, apply the oil can. You will see an explosion first in markets that anticipate it, which is the equity market, despite a declining bond market, which is what you want to pray for. The equity markets jump. Why's that happening? Right, let's wait. We'll get in. That's, that's what happens. When you make a major turn, like in 82, from bad to good, it is huge. For your business, you want to prepare your clients now. Talk to them now about what the likelihood is. Just ask your research departments. What do they expect interest rates to be and mortgage rates to be in six months? And ask your client, do you want to forego the opportunity right now for maybe an extra quarter percent lower in the mortgage of never getting it, of having that house sold out from under you, having to compete, having three and four bidders on a home? That's what's coming. If this turns, it will not turn slowly. All of a sudden, it will be a rush. And then the banks start disgorging some of their funds and lending them. Businesses that have, by the way, about a trillion and a half dollars on their balance sheets that don't spend it are going to see a reason to build that plant because they will look out three years and see the demand for what they make increasing. And then the Fed's going to have a problem. They'll have to ease back on the ore, reel in some of the liquidity, interest rates at the long end will start going up, mortgage rates will start going up, and it will be too late for some people. That's the environment you face tonight. Tomorrow, I pay very little, I don't predict things, I'm explaining what will happen if they do this. Tomorrow something may come out and make you think this is totally wrong. That poor guy, Oh, he must feel awful. <laughs> I got to tell you, in 1982, I felt awful for about six months. I was very lonely out there. It's a terrible feeling. What I'm telling you is listen carefully to the dialogue. Read the journal. Read your trade papers. Listen for those buzzwords. Revenue neutral. Interest rates going up. That'll be your signal. And... You, if you act on all these things, I will tell you, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, will be early. It's the worst thing in this business to be early. Because when you're early, you look wrong. And when you look wrong, you look foolish. That's why guys in my business always like to be wrong in a group. You know, did you do that? Yeah, me too. Oh, <laughs> Bernard Baruch said he made money one way. He bought things too early and he sold them too early. When I was a young fellow, I had just started in the business. The chairman of the board took me aside. I think he felt sorry for me. He says, Bob, I'm going to give you some advice now. You all know this is good advice for 30 years, but take my word for it. You will never get into a market at the bottom. Never. Always be prepared to see the thing you buy go down in price first, maybe 10%. And believe me, you will never get out of a market at the top. Never. Always be ready to see that asset go up 10% after you sold it. The guy that bought it's got to get something. But in the middle, there's 80% you can really live on. So here's my hope. Jeff and the boys are nice enough to have me back next year. <laughs> That as humble as I seem to be, I get up here and I say to you, and probably a lot of other people around the walls, I told you so. Thank you very, very much. For that. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Excellent job. Questions. Bob will be happy to accept questions. We have... Gene DeResta. Go right ahead, Gene. Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. I'll only take a couple because I know you guys got other places to go. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. The world that existed in the 
50s and 60s did not include the economies of China, India, Africa, Southeast Asia, yet that's the new dynamic. So I, I'm, I'm not in complete agreement with your statement that we are now number one, even Europe. Please respond to that. Sure. We're not number one. We've given up our position, but I will tell you this, in all fairness, I remember when the countries that were ahead of us in the, in the early 80s, late 70s, Japan and Germany. They were cleaning our clock. The Japanese stock market, when our Dow Jones was 3,000, had soared to 39,000. So you're absolutely correct. We aren't, which is good in a way. In a competitive system like ours, you unleash those competitive spirits, we will clean their clocks, but you got to let us go. It's not fair to say to a, a marathon runner, go run your race. Yeah, they're, they're good, but no, we're going to talk... anything anymore, sir. You, let, let me tell you this. Let me just tell you something. When they tell you that manufacturing has shrunken in this, in this economy, what they're looking at is employment in manufacturing. And it is absolutely true. Manufacturing jobs have disappeared. In terms of the proportion of our economy that is manufacturing, it's about the same as it was 30 years ago. We're just more productive. That's the difference. Yes, we don't produce. Now the return is on technology. It's on investment. It's why, why la wages are more or less flat. The return on labor is low because labor is, we have a lot of it. It's just, that's just supply and demand. All I'm saying is, if you let us do what we do best, we will again retain those positions. But it's not important that we get them in a year. It's changing the direction where people believe that we can do it. I have no doubt that, I mean, Japan, their market fell from 39,000 to 9,000 because they dropped out. Germany, I don't think we have to worry too much about Germany. But yes, you have China. Good. I don't know about you, but I respond to a challenge. I do. I mean, we have this trade agreement that's coming up with these countries. Believe me, we're not doing that for their benefit. Now, don't look at the employment effects. Look at the profit effects. But you're absolutely correct. We have let ourselves slip. And my analogy was well, you can't take a marathon runner, tie his arm behind his back and one leg up like this and say, go run your race. That's what they've done to us. So in a way, I'm glad there are people that differ with this view. Because quite frankly, if everybody agreed with this, it might be a little late to get the positions you need to get. But it's a fair discussion, and we have to wait and see. Yes, Alec Roberts. Uh, just, are you, is the way they're going to do this, are they going to bring back Simpson Bowles? Do you think that's what's going to happen? The question is, what about, are they going to bring back Simpson Bowles? Yeah. As you know, Simpson and Bowles had a committee a couple of years ago, came out a long-term plan. Unfortunately, a plan for taxes wasn't exactly what we need. But yes, it's going to be a long-term uh, plan that if the markets believe it's for real, and it's very important that people believe this, will have the potential to set us on a growth path again. But it's similar. It would be similar to that. But it's long-term in nature. What we've got to avoid now, and this is what they briefed Congress on, by all means necessary, avoid a recession. We cannot stumble into one. And the problem is it may not be caused by economics. You get something overseas that causes consumer confidence to fall, consumers pull back and people get scared. That's why this is such a dangerous is there, period of time. Is there going to be a lot of spending on infrastructure? You like Cuomo has been talking about that. And you would hope that part of this would not be paying a guy to dig a hole and another guy to fill it up. They'd be real jobs with real payoffs down the line. Not everybody can be a construction worker, but there's about a million people you could book to work real quickly who will then take the money and spend it. And that's what you really want them to do. It'll be like that. There'll be good reasons, but Bear in mind, Republicans and Democrats will be able to say we got what we wanted. That's critical, that the politics drive this. They both have to look good doing it. Yes, sir? So your economic scenario makes total sense. I certainly hope so. So help me understand the destruction that the regulation has done 
to the lending side. I mean, I, I see it in my business. I would say the first time home buyer rate is probably the lowest it's been in 25, 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the difficulty for someone to get a loan, it's actually tightening up. It tightened up again um, last month and again this month. I, I don't see how it's going to happen. It happens when the lender sees the competitors making the loans. The first. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm a banker. I, I think you're probably. So the, the biggest difference, what he's talking about is the tightening of regulation. And I get paid to lend money, I don't get paid to process paperwork. But when I get audited, when I say mine, when it's my organization, my, my institution gets audited by the OCC, the Office of Controller Currency. They expect us to lend to a certain criteria. And, and if we don't meet that criteria, we fail an audit. Or we have to put up more reserve. And what's happened is the criteria that we have to lend to from the federal government, that's what's time. We're not saying, listen, I, I want to make loans. The more loans I make, the more money I make. But we can't. We're being told by the federal government, lend money. What you're saying to me is, is that what we went through in 08 and 09 so frightened the government, they want to make sure, and is and it right, over? And rightfully so. Yeah, and rightfully so. I would hate to suggest that you can't do business unless you have no restrictions at all. In the long run, it's a good thing. Can they tighten it to a point where they kill business? Of course they could. But what I would worry about is if they replay the 08 scenario, they get on the phone to... Wells Fargo or Citibank, and you know, you guys haven't been lending up there. What's your problem? You lend, we'll take care of it. Don't worry, we got the FDIC, we got the Ginny May and Fannie Mae. We'll take care of that part of it for you. You make those loans. I don't want to see that again. Yeah, neither do we. I mean, what, what we see happening more likely is as the economy continues to improve, and that's what we're seeing, more borrowers the more businesses are qualifying. They're, they're understanding that there's liquidity requirements, that there's capital, you know, that you gotta, you, have, you gotta have the cash flow, you gotta be responsible with your credit. That's why more people are qualified. That's the only reason more people are qualified. You said that better than I could have ever said it, but that's exactly the point. If the economy starts to grow, things get better. And so you make it on volume. What is it? A rising tide floats all boats? Yeah, but some of those boats are on very small anchor chains. You know. <laughs> Jason. Uh, yeah, but how, how is the country going to change? Okay? We need to keep the money into the country. Okay? We, we need to keep the investments in the country. We need to create jobs in the country. And then it will all flicker down. Okay? We need to keep the money in the country. The That's why we're not number one. But you're right. But the only way we'll keep the money in the country, if you allow for no exchange controls and tariffs that bar out everybody and all those kinds of restrictions, the only way you do it in a free market economy is by giving a people a reason to invest here, to keep their money here. For example, all they got to do is cut the, the tax rates and companies for good economic reasons will bring money back into this country. You can't blame a country for keeping its funds. Up. The government's got to change it. Absolutely. We're, we're, giving our, we're giving the country away. We're selling the biggest buildings in New York to Saudi Arabia. Well, you know, I got to just. We're selling out. We did that in the 80s. Anybody remember Pebble Beach, guys? 
the RCA building. We sold them to the Japanese. The Japanese wouldn't let Americans play at Pebble Beach. We, they bought it for 800 million bucks. And I got very upset. And then somebody said, Bob, don't worry. They can't take it back with them. <laughs> and guess what? When things change, they bought, we bought it back for 400 million dollars. Guys here remember that. So all I'm saying is, what you're saying is 100% correct. The only way that it will change is if we can take the right course, which I think is almost inevitable. Yes, one yes. This relates to something you warned about earlier. A year or two ago, we heard a lot about uh, potential crisis with the Euro or countries involved with the Euro, with, with Greece, with Spain. And that seems to all have gone away at this point. Do you see that being a threat, a threat in the future? And if so, how much potentially could that derail the rosy predictions? Well, it's made? interesting. You all heard that about the European situation, Greece and Spain, the pigs and all the terrible. In one respect, what happened over there was a blessing for the United States. Because there was a time when people were looking at the euro to replace the dollar as the currency that most people wanted to put their funds in. No longer. Thank you very much. We're not too sure about the euro. They're not going to put it in the yuan or the ruble or anything else. It makes us the country of last resort. So in the short run, that's good. If we start our engine, we're big. We are very, very big in the world economy. We start our engine, we're dragging them all with us because our imports are their exports. And they're export-led, folks. We're not. But in many of those countries, exports rec represent 20, 25% of their economy. If they start to sell those things, they begin to pick up, things begin to look better. Are they the problem they were a few years ago? No. Are they still a problem? Yes. Can it get worse over there by a mistake? Yes. Is austerity the right thing for them? No. And they figured that out. Oh, wait, we had a laboratory going for us. Ireland tried austerity, they almost threw themselves into the Atlantic Ocean. Spain tried it, down they went. Now they're beginning to loosen that stuff up. I hope we learn. Yes, sir? Uh, I agree with you, but it seems... Can we stop right there? <laughs> I know what's coming the minute they say I agree with you. I agree with that last statement. Unfortunately, ideology seems to blind people to the consequences of austerity. Um, I am concerned about your proposed formula for... Uh, uh, for, for, for revenue neutral uh, long term planning. And I'm concerned that it's going to severely imbalance the high tax states, especially in the short term. Because I would imagine that if somebody, that, that if they get rid of the deductions, that you're going to have a significant decrease in home values uh, while people sort themselves out. And maybe over the long term, oh, and maybe nationally, there may be some reconfiguration, but certainly New York, Westchester, New Jersey, those areas, I think have a, 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 real, a real problem. You got a good point, but things aren't static, they're dynamic. You're in the New York legislature. You see this action coming. You know, because you're advising them, what could happen to them. So what do you think they're going to do? They're going to try and accommodate to that, one way or the other. New Jersey and New York, they vie against each other. Connecticut figured it out. You want people moving into Connecticut from New York, businesses moving in, lower the tax structure. That business decision moves them. So all I'm saying to you is, yes, there'll be dislocation. There'll be changes made. But we've been through this before. Right now, they limit deductions. They limit deductions now. Government is a very blunt instrument. It is. It is. So you're saying, we'll be in the New York legislature. What are we going to do to address the, the money that's flowing now to support the safety net? I mean, you're basically saying, so we can we're going to push that off to some other state now in order to uh, accommodate these, uh, these lower taxes. I mean, it, it, it seems... Never underestimate politicians. <laughs> oh, okay. What I got... What, no, seriously. What I was told in 1981, 79, 80, 81, we developed this view that things were going to change in policy-wise. What they said to me at the company, and when the chairman of the board looks at you across the table and says, Bob... I don't know what you're smoking. They never did this before. When did they ever give rich people tax cuts? I couldn't point to history. I couldn't point to it. But they did it because they didn't have a choice. They knew what they were doing back then. When they knew they were giving the wealthiest people in this country effectively the largest tax cut in American history. Not because these people spend a lot of money. 
It's because they invest money. They save money. That was our problem back then. So all I'm saying is skepticism is good. Watch it. Just watch what happens. When you begin to think that, well, maybe that guy had something going for him, maybe you try and change your mind. If not, it'll at least make you feel good. Uh, I just, I'm just telling you that politicians do what's in their political best interest always. And if New York is seen as a very high tax state and people who are paying these high tax rates are getting hit and they're going to move to another state, New York does something about that. They just do. And they've done it. What's Cuomo talking about now? The last thing he wants to talk about are tax hikes, I'll tell you that. He told de Blasio that. And that, that tells you something. They're on the same team. Folks, you guys are great. I'll be here if you want to punch me on the way out. But thank you again very, very much. Thanks again, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Another great job. Thank you all for attending. Watch our calendar of events on the website, and you'll be hearing from us. Have a great night.